Michelle. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to today's uh, little workshop about uh, using Azure Quantum to run your uh, Cascade programs on our partners, simulators and hardware using Azure Quantum. Uh, let me start with a single slide uh, that walks you through the stages of quantum software development workflow. Uh, using Azure Quantum Tools, or uh, for that matter, other kind of tools. Um, no matter which uh, tools, which platform you're using, you are going to probably go through all these steps. So um, let's say you come up with an idea for a hackathon, and you come up with an algorithm you want to implement for this project, and uh, now you want to implement it. What are the steps you are going to take? Uh, the first step, of course, is writing the code, uh, building the quantum part of your project. So for this, you are going to choose your language. In this case, it's going to be Cascade. And you're going to uh, choose the tools you will be using for it. Uh, more broadly speaking, Azure Quantum supports multiple languages, uh, Q-Sharp, Qiskit, and Zerg. And it allows you to develop programs in Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code or in Jupyter Notebooks. For today's demo, I'm going to stick to uh, Jupyter Notebooks because they are uh, easy to set up once you create your Azure Quantum workspace. You can just uh, develop notebooks in there or upload your notebooks from local system or copy them from the samples gallery. Plus, it makes for prettier demos. The second step, once you have written the quantum components of your code, you are most likely going to want to integrate them with the classical components of your code. In our case, you are most likely be using Python to write any classical code you want because Qiskit integrates really nicely with Python. The next step is testing your code. You probably don't want to run your code directly on quantum hardware because if you do that and then you realize that your code has a bug, um, you're going to take a very long time to get your results back. And uh, it's rather pointless to write uh, to run code on hardware if you're not sure it's correct or not. So that's why the quantum simulators are included in every uh, package, in every SDK with a programming language that I know. The, the simulators you can use for Qsharp and for Qiskit are different, so you are going to be using Qiskit standard built-in simulators, which I will not be diving into too deeply. I hope they have been covered in the previous workshop. So the part in which you are going to be using Azure Quantum is the last step of the workflow, the running your program on quantum hardware. Uh, currently, as of today, Azure Quantum allows you to run programs on hardware by three providers, IonQ, Quantinum, and recently added Rigetti. The other two uh, on this diagram, QCI and pa Pasquale, are still in the works. They won't be up in time for our week at Hackathon. And that's all I had for you in terms of the slide. Now let's dive right into the live demo. I like to live dangerously. I do my demos live. Let's see what it's going to look like. Um, now, uh, I think that somewhere in the Discord, there is a PDF instruction of how to uh, create an Azure account using your .edu email. Uh, this allows you to take a little uh, shortcut 
compared to the standard Azure account creation in that you don't need to put in your credit card information, which is nice, right? If you don't put your credit card information, you know it's not going to be charged. Uh, and the other part that that guide walks you through is creating Azure Quantum workspace using the Azure account. I will not be doing this right now because, um, well, I wanted to say that I don't have an EDU account. I do have one from Northeastern University where I teach a course in quantum computing, but I won't be doing this regardless. You are going to take my word for it that those instructions work. And if uh, they don't, if you run into issues with any step of the process, we have office hours on Thursday, 8.30 a.m. Pacific time, so 10.30 uh, Central time. There should be information about that somewhere as well. Uh, you are most welcome to join the office hours with any questions you have, and folks from our team will help you set up your environment. So now I'm going to take a little cooking show magic leap forward in time and assume that you have already created uh, an account, a subscription in it, and an Azure Quantum workspace. And I will show you how to navigate the workspace uh, once you have created it, what kind of things you can do there, how to run your Qiskit programs, and what useful information you can find there. So this is what your homepage of Azure portal is going to look like. You are going to have a list of resources here. Or if uh, the workspace you have just created doesn't show up there, you can go and find it through all resources. Here I have used uh, the workspace recently. So I am going to go right to it directly. So my workspace is called Azure Quantum Demo. Well, AQ Demo technically. Uh, this is the landing page of the Azure Quantum workspace. Uh, the important information in here on the essential step is the information about your workspace that allows you to uh, connect to your um, to connect your uh, Qiskit code to the provider backends to the workspace and through it to access the providers and effectively to submit jobs to your uh, hardware targets. Uh, I believe that that piece is also described in the instructions. But to uh, recap it a little, the two pieces you are going to need is the resource ID, this long string that has the information about subscription ID, resource group, uh, provider, and workspace name, and the location. For me, the location is West US because I'm based off Seattle. For you, it might be. East US, if that, that's probably closer to you folks uh, geographically. Uh, the second thing in this landing page is this menu of things that you can do in this workspace. Let's go through them in a somewhat logical order. So the first tab you want to be aware of is the providers tab. This is the list of all providers that are enabled in your workspace. If you use the quick create scenario for creating your workspace that is described in the PDF with the instructions, you are going to have, uh, I think, four providers here. IonQ, Quantinum, Rigetti, and um, optimization provider that is not subject of this hackathon. It's for quantum inspired optimization that is effectively classical, so it doesn't run on quantum hardware. You're most welcome to explore it, but it's not going to be for this hackathon. 
For me, I created this workspace before Rigetti was added. So I can add it here if I want to, but I probably won't do it today. Uh, for each provider, let's look, for example, at INQ. There is a number of uh, targets. Each target is either a software simulator that acts as a quantum device, but is not actually a quantum device. Or it can be one of the quantum devices, actual, that sits somewhere in their lab. For INQ, we have two devices. INQ QPU is their Harmony device, the 11 qubit one. And INQ QPU ARIA 1 is their new ARIA device, uh, if I recall correctly, 23 qubits. Uh, you can check the availability of those providers. Are they available or offline of those uh, targets? And you can check the queue time for them. So the queue time is an important thing you want to consider in your hackathon. Um, for the simulators, the queue time is very small. So if you submit a job to a simulator, you're going to get a result back within minutes. If, um, however, you submit your job to quantum hardware, um, there is rather, there are rather few quantum devices uh, out there plugged into Azure Quantum. So the demand can sometimes exceed the supply. And you can see that the queue time for those devices can be measured in hours. So what I recommend you to do is to focus uh, first over the first, I don't know, day of a hackathon on uh, run on coming up with your project and implementing it and testing it using simulators. But then around the mid time of the hackathon, come to a point in which you decide which jobs you want to run on hardware and run them to make sure that you leave enough time to get the results back from hardware execution and to do the interesting things that you want to do with them. I So the queue time is going to vary. I cannot tell you what it's going to be like this weekend. I sometimes got the results back in less than two hours Sometimes I got the results back in something closer to 12 hours. So this is something you want to uh, plan for um, submitting the job to QPU and getting the results back can take multiple hours. So allocate some time in the end of the hackathon to make sure that you have the time for this. And then work on something else like polishing the front end of the uh, of your project or preparing the presentation. Things that do not require uh, hardware. The second uh, tab we want to take a look at is called credits and quotas. Now, uh, if you create your workspace using the instructions I gave you. And uh, yeah, I should make a more general statement. The first time you create a quantum workspace uh, on your Azure account, you get um, Azure quantum credits. Uh, so $500 per provider to run your jobs on them uh, without paying for them. And this tab allows you to track the amount of credits you have and the amount of uh, credits you have already used. You can see that I ran some jobs here already and I have a lot of credits left for INQ, but less so for Quantinum. And you can uh, check your quotas in more details here. For example, for Quantinum, your credits uh, come in credits both for hardware and for emulator, the noisy simulator Quantinum offers that uh, matches the behavior of their actual quantum device uh, in great detail. 
so you can track separately the usage of hardware credits and emulator credits. For IonQ, you spend credits on running on QPU, but the simulator is free. So that's convenient if you want to test your code in the cloud without spending any credits. The next thing I should show you is the job management tab. Uh, that is going to be helpful once you start submitting jobs. So it shows you all the jobs that were submitted in this workspace. And um, some information about those jobs, the name, the ID, uh, the provider and the targets that were used. You can see that I do a mix of simulator and QPU jobs. Um, and their submission time and execution time. You can see that this, for example, was the QPU job that took approximately 12, 12 hours from submission to completion. You can also see that I work evenings. And finally, the last tab we are going to look at is where I'm going to spend the rest of the demo pretty much is the notebooks. This tab allows you to create or upload notebooks and to run your code in here. Allow me to use the full screen view to give us a little more space to explore. And uh, we are starting in the sample gallery. Uh, this is a collection of samples in multiple languages targeted for multiple providers that you can start with. In our case, we're going to be using Qiskit. So you can see that you can choose the provider here, INQ, Quantinum, or Rigetti, and copy this notebook to My Notebooks. My Notebooks is where you can uh, actually work with the notebooks, edit them, run them, all kinds of things. I have already copied uh, these notebooks over, so I'm going to open them and see what's going on here. Okay, Qiskit. Yeah, we will start with a notebook in which I walk through submission, submitting a Qiskit job to Quantinum provider. The workflow is similar for each provider and actually for each language, uh, no matter if you use Qiskit or q -sharp or Cirque. But there are some slight differences in which uh, tools are available. So it's good to look at the samples for each provider to see what uh, steps you should take. So what does uh, submitting a Qiskit job to Quantino looks like? The first step after you develop your code is connecting to Azure Quantum Workspace. If you copy over a notebook from the gallery, it is going to populate those two fields, resource ID and location, automatically based on the information from your workspace. These are exactly the same fields that I mentioned on the overview tab, the long string for source ID and the location. If you upload your own notebook, you will need to copy this code manually. Oh, and here I, for this notebook, I already executed all these cells beforehand so that we don't run into any unexpected issue. Uh, I will see how we are doing on the time once we're done with it, and I will do a proper live demo for the second example in which we are using INQ. So here, once you connect to the workspace, you can see what's going on there. For example, you can find the list of the backends offered by uh, this workspace. Here you can see that there is a list of targets, IonQ, QPU and Simulator, and Quantinum targets. 
we will go through the quantum targets now. Uh, for, uh, next, this uh, Hello World notebook has some helpful information about quantum targets and their properties. For quantum, there are three main types of targets. The syntax checker, also known as API validator, is a tool that you can use to check that your code runs uh, will run successfully, that it doesn't use any constructs that are not supported on this platform. So it doesn't uh, simulate your code or run it on hardware. It just goes through the code and uh, checks that it doesn't use anything that is not supported in the system. The second type is the emulator. The emulators are noisy simulators. So they are classical programs that, sim uh, that simulate the behavior of your quantum program as if it was executed on a quantum device. And they are noisy, so they uh, try to follow the noise model of the corresponding quantum devices. So the results you get are going to be very close to the results you would get on the actual hardware. For Quantinum, actually, I would recommend you to use emulators for your development because they are a lot faster than hardware and the results you are getting are going to be very close to the actual hardware results. So if you want to do something, for example, with error correction or exploring noise models, you can do it using these emulators without being in the queue for the actual quantum device for a very long time. And the last type of targets are the actual quantum devices. Uh, they have two, H11 and H12. And um, I am not sure what their availability is going to be over the weekend. They might be offline for this weekend. So that's another good reason for using emulators for Quantinum. They're much faster and they are going to be online. So once you have connected to the workspace, oh, well, this notebook does things in slightly the opposite order. So they connect to the workspace first and then build the quantum program. So here there is some code that creates a circuit with random number generator. We don't want to do anything too complicated for the demo. And here you see that you can use uh, the usual uh, Qiskit tools to work with this code. So here you can uh, draw the circuit implemented by this code. Uh, you could also use the Qiskit simulators to run simulation locally in this notebook without accessing Azure quantum targets. The next step is submitting the job to Azure Quantum. And for Quantinum, there is an additional step compared to IonQ. Because the first thing we want to do is we want to do API validation to check that our program is correct, that it is going to be supported by Quantinum. So we uh, choose the backend that is API validation for H12 system. And then we are going to call run on this backend to submit this circuit for a certain number of executions. Once you submit a job, you get back the job ID. Job ID is the main identifier you use to work with jobs. It allows you to find the job in the list of jobs on that tab, on the job management tab. It allows you to check the job status from the code and it allows you to pull up job results once the execution is complete. 
In this case, the API validation jobs are very fast. They don't do anything complicated in them. So they finish usually within seconds. Uh, here, this cell used the Qiskit function job monitor that checked the status of a job. And uh, it was interactive. So it went from job is actively running to job has successfully run. After this, we retrieve the result of the job and we upload those results as a histogram. Now, this histogram doesn't look anything like a random number generator results should look like, right? It gives us 0, 100% of the time. Well, the reason is that this is API validation. So for API validation, returning zero means that it actually, actually succeeded, that this job is valid to run on the simulator and on hardware. Any other kind of result would indicate that this job is not going to run on the simulator or on hardware. After this, you can run a cost estimation of the a program. You can estimate how much this job is going to cost before you run it, which is very convenient when you work with your own money. And uh, frankly, it is really convenient when you're working with credits as well, because if you want to plan to run some other jobs, you want to allocate some cost for them as well. Here, uh, I am switching to a different backend, the hardware backend, and I'm running a job called a, a function called estimate cost. The return is expressed in terms of HQC. Uh, it's a historical name. Uh, comes from no, actually. Okay, I'm not entirely sure what H stands from. It could stand either for Honeywell, which is what part of Quantino was called a year ago before uh, before the merger that made them into Quantino, or it could stand for something else. But HQC is, I think, Honeywell Quantum Credits, which tells us that we're going to use five out of our 500. Oh, sorry, out of our 40 that we get uh, to run this job. Uh, sorry, ah, oh, okay, it's it's not a question for me. Good, I was worried for a moment that I missed a question. Uh, so we are we see the cost estimation. And we think that it's okay. Now, the example notebook that you will get is going to stop about here. It's going to tell you what are the next steps uh, to run the job on a simulator or on hardware, or to look at other examples. But here I'm doing a demo, so I can uh, go further than the example. So here I am going to pull up the results of an earlier job that I ran. And you can see how I can do it. I can provide the job ID and use the get job method to get this job and then to fetch its results. So this is a job I did not submit in this run of the notebook. I submitted it some time ago. And I can fetch the results. So you can see that when I print the results of the emulator, it gives me a lot of uh, a lot of information about this job. It tells me on which backend I executed it, so you know that I did it on an emulator. And it gives me the results. The results we got here are very nice we get a 0 0.4 probability of one result and 0 0.6 of zero result. Uh, so this simulator runs 
with noise and it runs for the number of shots that you specify when you submit a job. So it runs for 100 shots and aggregates the results. And Q-Simulator acts slightly differently. We will look at that in just a moment. But this is uh, what your results are going to look like if you run the program on a simulator or on hardware. You are going to get some actual results rather than just the always zero result from the API validation. Uh, now we have uh, we have another 15 minutes probably. So let's switch to the INQ example that I did not run beforehand and see if I can do the same trick but live. This is a notebook that I just copied over from the sample gallery. I didn't do any editing on it. So you can see that this field is already filled, the resource ID and the location. I'm going to execute this cell and it appears that it did connect me to the, uh, to the workspace. We are going to pull up the targets of this workspace. Oh, and you can see that now our list is going to be longer. This means that last time when I executed the, that notebook, we didn't have some of the targets. For example, I think the area one was missing from those results. So you can tell that I executed that notebook for the last time before ARIA went online. That was some time ago. So next, the notebook does the same thing it did for Quantino. It walks you through the list of targets available. You can see that we have the simulator with 29 qubits. This simulator is noiseless, idealized, which means, whoops, it means it's not trying to behave like hardware, it's trying to behave like a perfect quantum system without any noise. And it is free, you can use it as much as you want. And then ARIA-1 and Harmony are the two devices we have uh, available with 23 qubits and with 11 qubits respectively. In this example, we're going to be using simulator, again, to not uh, use our credits for just the demo. So next, we're going to do the exact same thing we did in Quantinum scenario, build the quantum program. And the circuit and draws is exactly the same as it was there. Now we're going to submit the quantum program to IonQ. Um, this is happening live, and you see that it submitted a job with uh, this ID. And now you can go to the job management tab and find that this job uh, actually shows up in the list. It has a matching ID and the matching name, and you can see that submission time is just about now. And this job is actually already succeeded. That's a huge advantage of INQ simulator. It is fast. So when I go back to my notebook and I um, choose to plot the result of the job, the status is going to be that it has successfully ran. And the histogram is going to look like this, which is actually interesting. This is not the result I expected to get. And here's why. Uh, for Quantinum, their emulator runs multiple times and aggregates the results from each shot, same as it does for quantum hardware. For INQ, up until today, their simulator worked differently. 
it uh, used to run the program up until the measurements happened. And then it would produce a histogram of results based on the program state before measurement, rather than performing measurements and running the whole program again. So you would get an ideal distri distribution of probabilities. Uh, so it would be 50-50. Here we are getting an unequal distribution of probabilities, which surprises me quite a lot. Um, I'm going to look into this and figure out what's going on here. It is possible that the logic of the simulator changed. I know that in the past, folks were running into this behavior when they were trying, trying to do things like, for example, running random number generation for a single shot. You're supposed to get a single result, but you would still get a histogram of all possible results. I need to see what changed here. But then the last step is the cost estimation. The same thing that we do for Quantinum, but here the currency code is different. For IonQ, you get the cost in dollars. So here this job would cost us one dollar. It is actually a very small uh, job, but IonQ rounds up their costs so that you pay at least a dollar for each job. And I'm not going to run this on hardware because uh, hardware wait times are rather longer than the time we have remaining in our workshop. But this uh, should show you all the tools you have available in an Azure Quantum Workspace to allow you to run your Qiskit programs in Azure Quantum on our hardware partners offerings. So uh, that's all I had for you today, and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Okay, if we have no questions, then um, thank you so much, Maria, for going through the Kiskit demo. And I just want to make sure, does everybody know where to access the um, Azure Quantum Setup Guide in the Discord? We... Uh, I do not. Can you tell me where it is? Yes. So in our FallFest channel, let me just drop the link. Um, there's an FAQ channel, and we posted the Azure Quantum Add-on Challenge Guide. Um, I'll probably make a separate announcement and upload the PDF as well, but <clears throat> you can find out all the instructions um, on how to actually set up a Azure account to be able to um, make an Azure Quantum workspace. And then it also details all the things that Maria said to um, validate that you've run your jobs, um, showing your kind of usage quotas, as well as your Azure subscription ID. Um, <laughs> I know it's like a lot to go through, I think the first time setting it up, but like she said, there will be office hours on Thursday. And I think during the hackathon weekend too, if you guys need some help and want to use these Azure Quantum, um, I'm sure I can also, I think, help you guys set up the, the workspace because I've done this before. <clears throat> All right, I keep forgetting you have first-hand experience <laughs> with that. <laughs> yeah, this was testing a while ago. Mm -hmm. It has been a while though since I've used the workspace, but I think I think I still have my account and it's pretty, it's easy enough to set up and the video will also be posted. Um, and I think during our kickoff on Friday, I will probably maybe go through it just a little bit. Oh, I have a request. Do you guys actually have any of the hackathon projects that people have made uh, with Azure Quantum from previous events that you guys have done? Mm, we do. Yeah, I so think- If you go to Q Sharp developer blog and scroll a little down, we have Azure Quantum Challenge at QC Hack and Microsoft IonQ Challenge at IQ Hack recaps. And I think those come with links to the winning projects. 
Yes. Oh, amazing. So if, if you are looking for inspiration, you can check out those. Um, I think I think the hackathon organizers had a list of all projects somewhere. So if you want to snoop around, you're most welcome. Yeah, I think this would be awesome. I'm probably going to let our kickoff go over some of the projects um, made just to get people inspired. Thank you. Yeah, so much. some of them were really fun. Yeah, we had we had really fun ones at our event last year, so I'm excited mm -hmm. for this year. Yeah. Just the... Awesome. I'll go ahead and I think stop the recording then.